Sup, Chooms? How y'all living? Hope you all had a preem Christmas, and hopefully we all got our PlayStation 5s, our Xboxes, and Nintendo Switches this year. So get this, I was planning to take a few days off for the holidays, but then my Witcher senses detected a threat in the form of a new article published just three days before Christmas that supposedly shows that finasteride and dutasteride use are both linked to depression. Now, if you've been following my channel, then you know that this is extremely unlikely for many reasons. First of all, depression was not found to be a side effect at all in the initial randomized clinical trials for both drugs. Depression was only added to the finasteride package insert as a possible side effect in 2011 after several well-publicized cases of depression and suicide were noted in the mainstream press and became the basis of several lawsuits against Merck, who are the manufacturers of brand name Propecia. Without any scientific data at all, Merck then took the easy way out and added depression to the list of possible side effects for finasteride. Of course, finasteride-hating trolls will bring this up ad nauseum in order to exaggerate finasteride's supposed dangers, but lawsuits do not have to be grounded in scientific evidence to be effective. Lawsuits whether they are frivolous or not, will always be expensive to fight, and that is why Merck eventually caved to this pressure. It's obvious that adding this side effect was Merck's way to avoid litigation, because dutasteride still doesn't have depression listed as a side effect even today, and that's despite the fact that dutasteride is an even stronger 5-air blocker than finasteride is. Of course, What's the first thing every finasteride hater does when you question the validity of finasteride's mental side effects? They'll screech, but my neurosteroids! And they'll have this big emotional meltdown at anyone who points out the very obvious holes in their argument. So what is the basis for all of this fear-mongering, you may wonder? Well, it's just a bunch of meaningless rodent studies that aren't applicable to human beings. I've shown in several videos already that I'll link below that rodent studies on the effects of finasteride on things like mood and behavior are not at all relevant to human beings because in rodents, finasteride is a very strong blocker of the type 1 5-AR isoenzyme while it only has a negligible effect on the type 1 5-AR isoenzyme in humans. When I say negligible effect, I really, really mean it. In fact, with finasteride in human beings, the blockade of the type 1 5-air isoenzyme is about 100 times weaker than the suppression of the type 2 5-air isoenzyme. This is important to remember because the predominant 5-air isoenzyme in the brain is the type 1 5-air isoenzyme. Dutasteride blocks both the type 1 and type 2 isoenzymes, but keep in mind that dutasteride is the 5-air blocker that doesn't even have depression listed as a side effect on the package insert despite the fact that it is a more potent 5-air inhibitor than finasteride. So with that in mind, you wouldn't expect finasteride in human beings to have any effect on neurosteroid synthesis in the brain, even if there were effects on serum neurosteroid levels, which is not even well established. In any case, neurosteroids in the brain, neurosteroids in the cerebral spinal fluid, and neurosteroids in the blood don't necessarily correlate, and I presented evidence for that in prior videos. Just like with DHT, where scalp DHT levels are more important than serum DHT levels, levels, neurosteroid synthesis in the brain happens locally, and it is the type 1 5-air isoenzyme that is present in the brain, which isn't significantly affected by finasteride. Even dutasteride, which does suppress the type 1 5-air enzyme, still only has minimal effects on circulating neurosteroid levels, even when it is dosed at 2.5 milligrams per day, that is five times higher than the standard dose, as I showed in my recent Leo and Longevity video. Interestingly enough, in that video, I showed that high-dose dutasteride in women with premenstrual dysphoric syndrome actually improve their symptoms of anxiety and depression. So the bottom line here, Chooms, is that there hasn't been any clear-cut proof that users of 5-air blockers are prone to any neurological side effects like depression or brain fog, whether it be through the use of finasteride or dutasteride. Both drugs are perfectly safe. But you want to know what's really, really freaking depressing here, Chooms? It's hair loss. I'm not even kidding here. I've done videos on why going bald can outright ruin your life and can even ruin your health, and I'll go ahead and link them below. But this new study that just came out once again seems aimed to try to link finasteride and dutasteride use to depression. So that's why I felt I should analyze this new study, because it has all the hallmarks of becoming yet another anti-finasteride propaganda hit piece vehicle, just like the garbage articles from Dr. Trash and Dr. Earwig that get posted by finasteride haters all the goddamn time. The article we're talking about here is titled, quote, 
Association of 5A Reductase Inhibitors with Dementia, Depression, and Suicide, unquote. This article is not only looking at depression, but also at whether 5A blocker use is associated with dementia or suicide. It's from Sweden, and in Sweden, apparently, everyone gets a personal ID number at birth, and the whole population is then entered into a giant national database. Researchers can evidently access this database without getting any informed consent from anyone and then data mine the database in order to do studies like this one. That's what this study is. It is a database study. The researchers first identified from the database of 2,236,876 men who were alive in Sweden and turned 50 to 90 years of age between the years of 2005 and 2018. The researchers then looked at which men were prescribed either finasteride or dutasteride during this time period, which they could do because because apparently Sweden has a national prescription database too, so hooray for socialism, I guess. So anyways, the researchers only looked at men who were on 5 air blockers for benign prostatic hyperplasia, also known as BPH, and they actually excluded men who were on these drugs for any other indication, including hair loss. So the people who were on finasteride were almost certainly on 5 milligrams per day of finasteride for the treatment of BPH, and not the usual 1 milligram per day dose for hair loss. So we need to keep all that in mind too when we're interpreting the results of this study here. They also looked at men who had BPH but were treated with the other common type of medication for BPH which is a classification of drugs called alpha blockers. These drugs don't block the 5-AR enzyme but instead they block part of the sympathetic nervous system which ends up relaxing smooth muscles and allowing better urine flow through an enlarged prostate. An example of a drug like this would be Tamsulosin, also known by the brand name of Flomax. The investigators looked through the data to see how many men received a diagnosis of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, or a diagnosis of depression during follow-up. They also looked at how many committed suicide and used a very objective endpoint for suicide, namely people who died from suicide and not just attempts at suicide. So that's all pretty morbid right there. Anyways, the investigators also used some statistical tricks to account for the fact that the groups of subjects they were comparing were not really comparable in their health status. People who are being treated for BPH are not the same as people who don't have BPH. In fact, people who go to the doctor for any condition are frequently less healthy and often have other medical conditions than people who don't go see doctors. It turns out that the people getting 5 AR blockers were a sicker group than the ones not receiving these drugs. And the evidence for this is that there were differences between the groups and the incidence of diabetes and hypertension, as well as the use of beta blocker drugs that are usually used to treat heart disease. This is outlined here in Table 1, which we'll look at in more detail in a moment. The Investigators themselves note that there were major differences in the study groups. They used some statistical tricks to try to eliminate these confounding factors, but they really are just tricks. And so it's not surprising at all that we might end up seeing differences between the groups when we look at the results. So what were the results? Well, regarding dementia, on first analysis, it appeared that there was an association between the use of 5 air blockers and dementia, but this association disappeared the longer the subjects were on the 5 air blockers. The authors of the study felt that this association may have been spurious because when people present themselves for treatment of BPH, they sometimes are found to have previously undiagnosed dementia at the same time. Remember, we're talking about men over the age of 50 here. In fact, when the investigators more accurately assess the data by excluding men who had been on 5 AR blockers for uncertain amounts of time before the period of the study, they found that, quote, Associations of 5AR inhibitors with dementia and Alzheimer's disease were no longer significant. Unquote. On the other hand, the investigators felt that there was an association between taking 5AR inhibitors and depression that lasted throughout the study period. Here you see the graph showing the risk of depression over time and the slight increase in the risk of depression for men on any treatment for BPH. So as it turns out, this increase in depression was not just for men using 5AR blockers for BPH, it also occurred in men being treated for BPH with just alpha blockers like tamsulosin, which again are not at all related to 5-AR inhibitors. The authors say, quote, Concerning depression, all types of treatment were associated with higher risk compared with no treatment, and the magnitude of association was higher for treatments involving alpha blockers than 5-ARIs, unquote. Yes, that's right. The risk of depression was worse for alpha blockers than 5-AR blockers in this study. Imagine that. So when are we going to start hearing about 
post-temp solution syndrome, I wonder. Wait, don't give them any ideas. Anyways, in all seriousness, this data immediately raises a very important question. Isn't the slightly increased risk of depression for people undergoing any treatment of BPH probably just related to the fact that they can't pee and not that the drugs they are on? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if I had to live every day knowing that every time I took a piss, it would feel like maxing out a barbell deadlift, I would probably feel pretty similar to how the crestfallen warrior feels in Dark Souls. Finally, looking at the risk of suicide, despite this supposed increased risk of depression, there was absolutely no increased risk of suicide in any of the groups. This is good news for finasteride and dutasteride users, but of course it's also very bad news for the PFS Foundation, whose very existence is contingent on the unproven hypothesis that taking 5 air blockers causes people to kill themselves. So the question remains, does this study show that there is an increased risk of depression from taking 5 air blockers? The answer to this is no, and that's because the groups are not at all comparable. First of all, from the table in the paper, it's clear that a lot more people on 5 air inhibitors were taking beta blockers than in the other groups. Why is this important? Because one of the side effects of beta blocker use is, you guessed it, it's depression. And one major reason people are on beta blockers is heart disease. So the logical conclusion here, Jooms, is that in general, people taking 5 air inhibitors in this study likely just had more medical conditions than the people not on 5 air blockers. And the more medical conditions you have, the more likely you are to be depressed. That makes perfect sense to me. What's more surprising and completely ignored by the authors is that if you look at the table, men on 5 air inhibitors actually lived longer than men in the other groups. The average age of death was 86 for men on finasteride, 85 for men on dutasteride, and 84 for men on 5 air blockers plus an alpha blocker. The age of death was only 82 for men on alpha blockers alone, and only 80 for men on none of these drugs. So, like I've said in my earlier videos, there is evidence that 5 air blockers may actually be life-saving and life-prolonging, and this study, if anything, supports the already very strong evidence that finasteride can prolong your life by reducing the risk of cardiovascular and neurological diseases by lowering the trash hormone DHT, and I'll post videos going over the evidence of that in more detail below if you're interested in learning more about that. So, what this study actually does is further reinforce the idea that taking 5 air blockers doesn't cause dementia or suicide. The big problem with the study is that it is not a randomized control study, so the groups aren't really comparable. Therefore, you can't take seriously the claim that 5 air blockers cause depression. In order to test that hypothesis, you would need a randomized trial where men were randomized to either a 5 air blocker or a placebo treatment. Then you would need a follow-up to those subjects for years to see if the treatment group developed more depression compared to the placebo control group. You may think, oh, a study like that could never be done. That would take far too many resources and far too much time. But guess what, Jooms? Those studies have already been done. The original clinical studies on finasteride and dutasteride all had that kind of study design, and there was no evidence of increased risk of depression at all. Unfortunately, studies like this one are probably only going to further perpetuate the myth that 5 ARs cause depression, but I think you can see from my analysis analysis that this is complete BS. Both finasteride and dutasteride are very safe drugs, even when used in older people at high doses, let alone when used in younger people at a dose of just one milligram per day or less for androgenic alopecia. So there is a good chance you'll see some fear-mongering online about this study in the near future. You don't have to worry about it, though. It's actually good news. It provides further evidence against 5 air blockers causing dementia or suicide. It does not at all establish a link between 5 air blockers and depression. In fact, the risk of depression was highest in people just taking alpha blockers like Flomax, and adding a 5 air blocker lowered the risk of depression. Not only that, the study provides evidence that, if anything, 5 air blockers favor increased longevity and health. So, even though you might hear people online in the near future twisting the results of the study, you now know that it just provides even more evidence of the long-term safety for finasteride and dutasteride use. So, go ahead and take your finasteride knowing that you can celebrate this new year with the full reassurance that you will never have to be a bald and bearded clone who will forever be known amongst his peers and friends as that bald guy. Your hair is worth fighting for, and anyone who tells you otherwise is just trying to drag you down to their level because deep down, these DHT simps are jealous that you had the balls to save your hair. And with that, God bless, and I'll see you all again in the year 2023. Good night.